Hey, to all the real estate professionals out there, I want to let you know the Buyer's Mind is sponsored by Homebridge Financial. Homebridge loan officers are experts in new home financing, and they bring sales ideas and strategies and market intelligence and programs that will help sell homes. To learn more about that, go to builder.homebridge.com. Homebridge Financial, home financing made easy. What has the internet done to sales over the years? And what will it do next? Let's talk about it today on The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Welcome, everyone, once again to The Buyer's Mind, the podcast where we want to know how people make purchase decisions and, and what influences that and what influence we can have on that. How do we help people to do what they really want to do anyway? And today we're going to talk about sales and how the internet affects sales. We'll bring on a really, really interesting guest along those lines. Joined as always by our show producer, Paul Murphy. And Murphy, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give it away as far as uh, our age, uh, but let's just say it's safe to say that you and I were not millennials who grew up with the internet. Is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. <laughs> <laughs> not even close, actually. Uh, but it's interesting because now, as consumers, for you and I both, how much do we rely on the internet when we're when we're pursuing a purchase decision? You know, it's a ton. Uh, you know, I find myself doing a lot of research when I'm in the midst of trying to do a purchase. Yeah, so when we, when we look at that, we know that that the internet can give us so much information that back in the day when we had to make a purchase decision, it was all about research. It was about finding the right people. And it was actually very, very difficult. And yet, has the internet made it easy to buy things, especially non-discretionary, bigger ticket items, right? When we're talking about cars and homes and fine jewelry and financial services uh, products, uh, what do you think, Murph? Has the internet made it harder or or easier to make purchase decisions? You know, the the amount of information out there just tends to make it more confusing for me. Uh, it's really hard for me to get my head wrapped around. This person says this. Uh, this person says that. Uh, do I go left? Do I go right? Uh, it, it just it mm -hmm. gets to be overwhelming because there are so many opinions out there. You know, I was uh, considering recently whether I wanted to purchase the the Oculus Go, which is sort of the starter level for a virtual reality headset. It's a standalone headset. And I was like, do I want to? Do I not want to? And part of the problem is, is I was trying to research it online. And there are so many articles and reviews, but they were all written by people who are much smarter than I am when it comes to this type of thing. In fact, most of them were written by serious gamers who've got, you know, extremely high tech equipment and they're trying to do a review on something, but it's from a completely different perspective. The reviews were just frankly more confusing. It wasn't until I was actually in a store where I found a guy, it was happened to be at a Best Buy, and I just asked for his opinion. Now, they didn't even sell it. They were sold out at the time. So I, he said, you're going to have to order it online in any event. But when I was asking him about the Oculus Go, he, he stopped and he just said, well, how much do you know about this stuff already? Like, are you a serious user? Like, no, it's the last thing I am is a serious user. And he asked me a couple of questions. He said, I'm going to tell you right now, you, you are who they designed this for. This is the entry level stuff. It's not the most sophisticated, difficult to figure it out. You can put it on and use it right away. It's miles ahead of where we were just a few short years ago. And for a couple hundred bucks, what's the worst thing you can do? And he was so right because he knew me well. And I think that's the main thing is that when we're thinking as sales professionals, how we interact with the Internet, the fact of the matter is that the Internet does not know our customers well enough on an emotional level. They don't know how to ask the right questions to our customers. And that's where great sales professionals come in and really earn their stripes. And we're going to have a fascinating conversation today with Dennis O'Neill about his book, Sales Actualization, Outselling the Internet to have that really great conversation on how the internet can help us in sales and oftentimes how it can hurt us in sales. Let's listen to Dennis O'Neill. 
Well, I'm thrilled to have on the buyer's mind, Dennis O'Neill. I've known Dennis for a lot of years. We've worked together. In fact, I've, uh, I can credit Dennis with really helping me out, especially early on in my company with my web presence, with my branding, with my marketing. Uh, just really, really helpful. He's a genius along those lines. But he's also one of these interesting guys that understands the marriage between sales and marketing. Sometimes there are people who really get sales and really get marketing, but Dennis gets both. And we're going to talk today about his approach and about his book, Sales Actualization, Outselling the Internet, provocative title. Please welcome to the buyer's mind, Dennis O'Neill. Dennis, how are you doing, sir? I am doing great. Thanks very much, yeah. Jeff. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to participate. Absolutely. Uh, representing uh, both the coasts here, I in California, you're out of Maryland, if I'm not mistaken. That is right. That is right. Yeah. East Coast. Okay. All right. Uh, I, before we get into the book, let, let's just talk about that sales marketing thing here. You know, oftentimes, as you know, over your career, you've seen sales and marketing get lumped together. They are two very, very different disciplines. I think sometimes people think, well, I understand sales and therefore I understand marketing or I understand marketing and therefore I understand sales. Uh, right. They're not the same beast. And uh, no. yeah, you've somehow figured out how to live in both worlds. <laughs> yeah, it, I would completely agree. They're absolutely not the same. Uh, I, I have spent, uh, I've been in sales roles for 25 plus years and, and a lot of that I've had sales and marketing both. Um, and it's just, uh, it is a very different perspective in terms of the marketer's goal. You know, they think systems, they think big, they think campaigns, they think, how do we build demand? Mm -hmm. And there's that spot in the middle really where both sales and marketing overlap. And that's really sort of the perception, rapport, perspective components of the buying process. And, mm -hmm. and then there is that uniquely last mile um, sort of portion of that sales process that is uniquely the salesperson. And that's, you know, how, how do we get them that last little bit over to the yes and from a, from a shopper to an owner? If I look at it and I say that, that marketing is largely about lead generation and sales is largely about lead conversion, is that too oversimplified? No, I don't think so. I think that's probably a good way if we needed to put them in two distinct buckets. You know, mm -hmm. I think the that part that really sort of that that middle part that sort of overlaps the the both of them obviously marketing's goal especially these days with digital marketing departments you know they're sometimes they're actually named lead generation departments because um, mm -hmm. that's really their goal right. but there's that spot in the middle of sort of building the want right sort mm -hmm. of building the desire for the product it is that you're selling that does become the responsibility of both halves. You know, the marketers mm -hmm. need to, to develop the, the creative, the ads, the messaging, the perspective to be able to sort of build that interest from the actual consumer. And then once they've reached out, it's the salesperson's job to then build a relationship, not with just the product, but also with them between themselves and the purchaser. Um, so that's the part where I think they both feel like they've got the same role, basically. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if if we say that marketing's job is lead generation, well, it's not just any old lead. It's getting a lead through the door who might actually want to buy something. Exactly. Yeah. A qualified lead, right? That's a common mm -hmm. way to describe it. Sure. Yeah. Somebody sure. even going to be a fit for the product. Let's let's talk about about that for just a second on the marketing side and how marketing tees up sales because, you know, generally when you look at what marketing is, it's the it's the presentation of the shiny object. It's here doesn't mm -hmm. it look pretty and you know you look <laughs> at uh, you know the fast food billboard of a perfectly made uh, hamburger <laughs> that looks so very very good. Right. And so it's all about you know what you're moving to and yet I've seen some really effective marketing that really hits on what you're coming from or what's wrong now. Mm. I'm thinking about, you know, the mattress company that came out and said, if your bed is seven years old, it weighs significantly more than it used to just through the accumulation of dust mites and body, uh -huh. uh, you know, and whatever. Uh, and right. it just grosses you out so much that it creates <laughs> the need. Um, what do you think about that approach of looking at it, not just from what that consumer might be moving to, but why they need to move to it in the first place? Yeah, you know, it's it's um, and this is where we're going to probably talk about some of those overlap examples, right? I mean, obviously, you you know, I've had the um, the pleasure of working together for years, and you know, here you're talking about the difference between current dissatisfaction and future promise, mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately, the marketer as a marketer, your your goal is to at least. To, when someone interacts with an with a piece of advertising, and I say that now because advertising can take many different forms from an actual mm -hmm. ad itself or to a piece right. of content, the goal is to get 
people to feel something, right? To, to have them have some kind of emotional response. And sometimes that is the showing them the shiny object and making them want it, making them think that, wow, that's amazing. And my life will be better when I have that thing. And sometimes it's making, pointing out that their current situation is maybe not as great as it could be because they've got seven years worth of dead skin in their mattress. And now it weighs twice as much as it used to. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I think both can be effective you know, it's, it's a matter of thinking about who is your audience and, and what, what is the most likely thing to get an emotional and ultimately a physically emotional response that might trigger that lead, right? Trigger the action. Um, so it's very, very similar in, in terms of that uh, identifying what might move that person forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's really interesting because, of course, we talk so much on the, in the, on the sales side about how people ultimately make decisions based on the emotion. So either mm -hmm. way, whether we're showing something beautiful that they're moving to or showing something ugly that they're moving from, either way, it's about striking that emotional chord in order to get them to move forward in the first place. And that is uh, a point of overlap, as you've been mentioning, I think appropriately so, between mm -hmm. sales and marketing is to try and figure out wh where does that emotion come into play. But sometimes uh, salespeople struggle with that a little bit because they say, well, I'm not a really emotional person. Uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to walk around with a Kleenex in my hand trying to dab a tear <laughs> just to try and get a sale here. Uh, sure. But it's interesting because, you know, Dennis, I've known you for years. I, I wouldn't read you as somebody who's, who's overly sappy and yet you mm -hmm. understand the role of emotion in the process. Yeah, because I think, you know, emotion doesn't necessarily have to mean sappy, right? I mean, we can all feel things, even if it's, a, you know, excitement, right? You don't have to be a, you know, you don't have to tell the story that's going to make somebody cry about, the, you know, the tree that they're going to plant in the yard of a new home or something like that. that mm -hmm. That's not necessarily that. And, and, and actually, second of all, that's not even going to connect with every single buyer either, right? So it's, right. it's more about trying to identify who your buyer is, maybe the prospect standing in front of you, or if you're a marketer, you're thinking about sort of a, you know, a persona or a user type that you're trying to reach, you know, what kind of thing you know, w would make them feel something, whether or not it's something sappy or whether or not it's making them feel gross about going home and sleeping on that mattress <laughs> that right. we keep talking about. Right. Yeah. We, yeah. we yeah. know that's probably going to make them feel something. Um, and you know, it's that emotional connection that is, um, you know, so much more powerful. I mean, as you talk about all the time, than the logical one, you know, my, my problem with that logical connection that so many sort of low performing salespeople tend to rely on is that it's just, it's such a weak thread, right? Like if the only reason that you're, someone is purchasing from you is because the, you know, the price is the lowest or that the, you have this one thing that makes the difference to them. And it, when you remove the emotional components, you know, you're, that thread can be broken by any new variable that introduces mm -hmm. into the process. Whereas the emotional connection is much muddier. It's a, it's a lot harder to break. It's a much more real connection between a buyer and a salesperson. I love it. I love it. Uh, and that actually, um, it leads to something interesting that you say in the book. We're going to talk about the book here, Sales Actualization, Outselling the Internet. And you make a really important point uh, that I was w worth underlining for me, for sure. Uh, if you're stuck in transaction facilitation, you're in trouble. And yeah. uh, that, that goes hand in hand with what you were just talking about, with the idea that when you remove the emotional component then that thread, as you so aptly define it, uh, is uh, is broken by anything, by any new variable that's going to come along. Um, I, I assume you've been watching this happen for years, where you see the transaction facilitation versus what is truly sales. One of my first, uh, after after school, my first full-time, one of my first full-time sales roles was I, I sold new cars for several years. Oh, really? And yeah, we think about the car business in the nineties, you know, this was, it was major impact by the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And then and this new tool that consumers were given where now they could look at prices and used to have to go buy like books. People used to come in with before the internet was even more prevalent, but right, right. Um, you know, I saw these salespeople, you know, I worked, I was a young guy at the time and I saw salespeople that had been selling cars for, you know, 40 years. And, and they just, they just railed against the internet It's the worst thing ever. You know, why do people have them now? They know now they know this and they know that. And they were just really struggling with not being the gatekeeper to this kind of information. Cause that's where they got their power. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, the, the internet took all that power away from them. Um, 
and it, it, they just they just didn't know what to do. I saw I right. saw a lot of veterans just just fizzle out completely mm-hmm. just because yeah. they just well yeah we were, we were taught in training sessions you know information is knowledge is power right information is king and we mm-hmm. were taught you know I'll give you this information I'll give you that information but I'm going to hold on to this information I might be able to use it against you later on and suddenly <laughs> uh, that little trick uh, gone by the wayside because suddenly information is ubiquitous it was a complete game changer and i think it ex- yes. frankly it exposed a lot of people uh, that were yes. much more involved in transactions than they were in actual selling I, well to give you an example of that like fear of of hold you mentioned that holding back that information you know in you uh, and this is something i talk about in the book too and you, you used to go to purchase a car if you were interested in a car before the internet and you wanted to know like what colors it came in and you know how mm-hmm. big was the trunk and your options you had to you went to the dealership to get a brochure right. unless you decided right. to Asked for the manufacturer. Well, mm-hmm. I remember um, in the dealership, the the you know the older the older school sales team they would take the brochure and make sure that it was behind the desk, mm-hmm. the rack, because mm-hmm. that way they didn't want anybody to get a brochure without right. them going through them first. Sure, uh, they were scared to death, scared to yep. death of even that information getting out because they wanted to control everything. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. There's the, so the, many better ways to make value, and uh, there's, there's, no there's so many more ways to more be valuable as a salesperson. Yep, a, a different world, no doubt about it. Uh, mm-hmm. The book is called Sales Actualization: Outselling the Internet. Uh, give us the origin of that uh, title. Yes, yeah, so the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and uh, I know you're familiar with that, but mm-hmm. uh, you know the the sort of the pyramid of sort of where human need comes from, you know, and if you think of obviously bottom of the triangle, it starts with sort of the basics, you know, you're needing things like food and shelter. Um, And as you go up in terms of human levels, you know, performance, and eventually the peak of that uh, is referred to as self actualization. Um, So as I'm watching, you know, throughout my career, the internet sort of like, really becoming a consumer from from not existing to becoming an everyday part of everybody's lives but but being a part of the sales process and marketing process throughout this entire time i've always just sort of been intrigued with with how that has changed the buying process and as i started seeing the salespeople who were just slowly fizzling out as the internet just got to be a better and better salesperson and how the they were just these salespeople just had you know, they railed against the power of the internet that it had. I noticed that n- not everybody had that problem. Not not every salesperson was really concerned. I mean, some people were like, oh yeah, sure. Bring in your printouts and, you know, bring in this and bring in that. And, you know, instead of railing against it, they instead embraced what they did better than the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I found myself sort of like going, okay, and asking questions about like, where would these skills, you know, what, what are these unique skills that the internet is either already doing? What is it that the internet is trying to do? And what do I think maybe they can't, it can't do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I, I was inspired by Maslow's pyramid and, and organized it into the sales actualization pyramid. Yeah, the book is written in an interesting way, too, because, uh, you know, I, I salespeople have short attention spans. I, I can say <laughs> that because I'm a salesperson with a short right. attention span. And uh, the chapters are just, you know, a couple of pages long, mm-hmm. but it's really a, a collection of thoughts it, 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 that's expanded each way. Right. That's probably the best way to look at this. You no, know, you're a hundred percent correct. Um, a lot of the book was not written in order. Uh, just mm-hmm. over time, I, I wrote these pieces here and there. And then as I was sort of organizing the pyramid, I sort of filled them in in the order that I thought that they fit best. And then I, I filled in the blanks that I thought that needed a little bit more explanation. Sure. So it was yeah. absolutely written that way. Yeah. There are some really interesting points that you make, though, that really caused me to just go, whoa, he is so right. Mm-hmm. And in fact, here's one that I'll give you from the, from the book that I actually shared with a sales team just this last week. I gave you credit. But uh, <laughs> I, I love this quote here. The, inter- the Internet is the biggest feature dumper ever. And it's so yes. funny because in sales, we talk about feature dumping all the time, you know, like feature dumping, mm-hmm. bad, 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 bad. But when right. we look at the Internet, I, I never thought of the Internet as a feature dumper. And yet that's exactly what it is. Yeah, it really is. It's just, it's all data, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's just all just numbers and stats and measurements. And yes, there's photos, but you know, that's the same thing. It's just feature dumping. It's just look at this, look at this, look at this. You know, it doesn't have the context of, of it's who its audience is. Right. Um, Yeah. 
Big limitation. So, and that's a big part of what you've done then in the book is to look at it and say, uh, well, again, to put it in your words, when information is free and ubiquitous, customers value perspective. And a large part of this book is the idea of the salesperson providing wisdom uh, rather yeah. than information, right? They, the internet can already give uh, the information. What does the salesperson do that's different? Because otherwise, you know, w boy, w we... We think that, well, if I just have enough data, I'll be able to make a wise decision. That's not how it works, is it? No. I mean, and think about, uh, you know, anytime you're making a big decision, the, the fear oftentimes comes from not knowing what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And and that's what the Internet can't really solve. You'll never know if you've read every article that you need to read to be able to buy the best camera. You right. know, you'll never know if you've actually like considered all of the best brands if you didn't find the one that you should mm -hmm. have found, right? So there's this fear of missing out. The fact that you, while you could theoretically ask questions, you know, the, the problem with the Google search box, which I love and use mm -hmm. a million times a day, like everybody else sure. does, right. is that it, it relies on the fact that I know what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it relies on me typing something into that box and, mm -hmm. and that's something that's not human, right? So that, right. that, that's something that is a differentiator as a human, as a salesperson, I, I have the ability to learn and ask questions and ask the right questions about my shopper, about my mm -hmm. buyer, and to then actually give them the wisdom and perspective that they didn't even know they needed mm -hmm. to make the best decision. Right. Um, and the salespeople that operate at that level, they're, they're not threatened by the internet because they know mm -hmm. they're doing something that the internet can't do. But it's, but it, I, I'm curious about your perspective on this because mm -hmm. when we look at what happens going forward and if salespeople choose to ignore this, they might be in trouble. The fact is the internet is getting smarter. And mm -hmm. when we look at uh, the way that uh, Google is going to, and, and others like them, uh, are learning the behaviors, the 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 uh, preferences of their user, now what's happening, it's like, well, I think you might want to be thinking about this instead. It, do you agree with that? Do you think that the internet is getting smarter and therefore that salespeople are going to have to stay up in front of this? Because eventually it, it could run some salespeople out of the job. True. Yeah. And, and I do absolutely believe the internet is getting smarter. I mean, what, what the big companies, you know, the big three, right? Amazon, Facebook, and Google are doing with artificial intelligence is really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think that, you know, one of the, one of the levels that I talk about in the book in the pyramid is the the relationship level, which is sort of, um, you know, closely related to that wisdom level where you, you have enough of a relationship with a buyer that, you know, you can ask them the question questions maybe that might be sensitive for some other salespeople to ask mm -hmm. them. Or you, you can know them to be able to know what they would most benefit from, right? And I think what we're seeing now with AI and data collection and, and the way they're able to process all this information is, is that sometimes they can come up with some pretty good suggestions, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. so I absolutely believe that they're making strides. I think they've got uh, still a long way to go because I'm sure you get some really oddball suggestions in your feed at times too. Like, mm -hmm. why did Google think I was interested in this? Why right. is Facebook showing me this ad? Yeah. Um, so there's definitely room to grow, but there's there's no doubt about it. They're they're encroaching in that space a hundred percent. But but this goes. So we tie this back earlier to where we were looking at the role of emotion and how as human beings we make decisions from our emotional core. We support them with logic. This is one where the internet is going to have a hard time. And I'd say. And they can't get there, but they're not there mm -hmm. yet, really uh, trying to identify and understand. Because if we have that relationship, I'll let you into my life. I'll let you into my heart. I'll let you into my emotion. It's difficult mm -hmm. to do that with, uh, with the Internet. It, it really is. I mean, no matter what, it's still going to be spitting data back at you, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be spitting yeah. solutions and tools and, you know, the, it, it, it's going to assume that you know what to do with it, right? Like right. that's, um, you know, the joke of the, you know, holding a hammer and doesn't make somebody a carpenter, right? You mm -hmm. know, like, mm -hmm. and the internet basically throws hammers at you and says, here, you know, I mean, it's like it assumes that you're going to know what to do with it. But, you know, somebody who can really ask the right kind of questions to get to know what's right for the buyer and their family and what mm -hmm. is truly going to improve their lives and make them better. 
that's that's still not something that the internet has the ability to do. But you make an interesting point that that if that's not what it's doing, then in the book you suggest that the internet has obliterated our patience levels. And I look mm-hmm. at it, you know, one of the things I frequently remind salespeople is that a confused mind tends to say no. When we get right. overwhelmed with logic and analysis, uh, we just go back to whatever we already know. We go back to our comfort place, whatever that is. Uh, but the internet, you suggest, is absolutely obliterating our patience levels. Because there's, it makes it very, very difficult to be able to assimilate all of that data. So by the time mm-hmm. we're done, what do we do? Oh, I don't even know what to do. What does Amazon right. say? I guess I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and I would say too. You're right. You see this sort of situation where you get into you've been searching for that, you know, the the perfect w- widget for hours at Google, and you're just exhausted, and you're looking at things here and there, and reviews on this site, and reviews on that site, and then you know, sometimes you, you just sort of give up and you go like, all right, well, whatever. I think this might be the closest thing that solves my problem. And, mm-hmm. and I guess for lower dollar purchases, you know, that I think that's probably a risk that a lot of people are willing to take, you know, that they mm-hmm. haven't bought the right. right thing for them, you yeah. know, but, but as you go up that dollar scale, you know, I think in action, is the result of that. You know, mm-hmm. the people just don't make a decision. They don't, they don't buy the new car. They don't move to a new home. They don't make any other kind of large investment or purchase because they're just too confused to say yes to anything. Right. Um, and that, I, that's, that's, you know, I keep going back to that. This is where the, this is where the, a, a real salesperson, somebody that's sort of operating up at that higher level um, can actually make a big difference. I mean, it's, you know, I, I know sort of share the belief that, you know, sales is an art form. You know, mm-hmm. it, it is not something that is that is can be simplified down into to words on a page, um, words on a screen, you know, similar to the way that um, I use the comparison often of the, you know, the joy of painting with Bob Ross. Right. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I can watch him paint, you know, I'm mesmerized by watching him paint and he makes it look incredibly simple. I mean, I can buy the same paint that he buys. I can, mm-hmm. I can buy the same canvases, but that doesn't necessarily, that, that absolutely does not mean that I've seen it now on the internet. And that means that I now, I know everything about it to be able to reproduce it the same way. Um, and that, that's the difference. That's what I, that's how, one of the reasons why I know that sales is an art form, because I can, you can read every book, you can read every script, but it still doesn't prepare you for the variables that you're dealing with when you're dealing with another human and you're truly trying to solve their individual problems and, or, or identify the ones that they don't know they have. Right. Um, right. Those are the best kind. You uh, proffer in the book here that the highest level of sales actualization is meaning. And I love the examples that we have. You know, you, you use Apple very quickly, which is I'm mm-hmm. all over that one as a, mm-hmm. as a fellow Apple geek. And we want to have meaning in the products with which we interact. We, we don't want to see it as simply a commodity where I'm going to mm-hmm. chase the best price. We, we want to feel really good about the purchase decisions that we make. And so from the perspective of the sales practitioner, it's providing meaning above intelligence, even above wisdom. Can you expand on that mm-hmm. just a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I, I think that it's, you know, it's, it's obviously, um, you know, the salesperson doesn't have to create meaning on the scale of an Apple marketing campaign, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it, mm-hmm. uh, they don't, they're, they're not responsible for $91 billion in revenue or whatever that was Apple reported last quarter. Right. Um, you know, they, they just, they didn't need to manage their prospect pool, right? Their sales mm-hmm. office. So what they have the ability to do is to identify what it means to do business with them. And and I mean them personally, not even a a connection beyond the the product or service that it is they're selling, but you know, why do you buy from bill? You know, why do you buy Mm -hmm. from Sally? Right? Like I buy from these people because this is who I am. And Mm -hmm. so being able to, to find a connection that prospect then internalizes as part of their own identity. Um, I'll I'll go back to a, a, a car example where, um, he did eventually, um, get replaced by the internet, but, but a wonderful guy, um, a wonderful guy that I worked with in the car business who had been there for, you know, been in the same dealership for 30 plus years, never took it up, you know, ne- never talked to anybody that walked in the door. And he had a steady stream of people every single day. And it was because he had been there for so many years that he had a book of business that people came to buy from him and they told their friends and their family and, and everyone, generations of people came to him 
because that's what they did. That's who we buy from. We buy cars from Lee. That's mm -hmm. what we do. So it was to buy a car or from someone else would have been against who they are. You know, they would have been against it almost have been like against their own nature to purchase from someone else. And that's the kind of connection when you can help a buyer prospect be able to identify what it means to do business with you. Maybe that means what you support individually. Maybe you also have a, you maybe have a similar uh, charitable interests. You know, maybe you have a uh, kids in the same school or maybe you're supporting the same community. These are the kind of things that when they believe they are supporting something that they believe in, then, then they have now this unbreakable attachment of meaning. I, I couldn't buy from somebody else because that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, I, I believe, um, the, the, the pinnacle of value in a salesperson and an unbreakable bond um, that just guarantees success. In marketing, we talk about the difference between a brand preference and a brand insistence. Mm. I, I'm just, we're looking at it the same way here, right? With a salesperson. Yeah. Well, I like that salesperson versus I won't do business with anyone else because they provide that meaning. I, I love it. Uh, the book is Sales Actualization, Outselling the Internet by uh, Dennis O'Neill. A great book. It's, a, it's an easy well, it's an easy read in the sense that, you know, some books, their the publisher will say, I need this to be 40,000 words. And so they get <laughs> puffed it up into 40,000 words. That's not this book. But it's a book right. that's going to make you think. It's going to make you just challenge and question and say, what does that mean to the way that I do business? It's great stuff. And Dennis, before we uh, let you off the phone here, we're going to put you on the hot seat. Rapid fire questions, rapid fire answers. You ready? Awesome. Yep. Uh, here we go. Your very first job was what? Very first job was uh, soliciting donations for a local charity supporting handicapped uh -huh. children. Telemarketing. All right. I love it. I love it. Uh, an album from your youth that you listen to over and over again. Uh, Motley Crue, Shout at the Devil. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood? Mm. Uh, hmm. Piazza. Piazza, jeez, mm, I should know the name. It's a piazza in Rome. I love the city. Love the city. Love it. Love it. I'm going there next mm. year. Love it. Uh, any book that you've read that's made a profound impact on your life? Mm. Uh, Finite and Infinite Games by James Kars. Okay. It's, um, it's, a, it's a deeper philosophical read, but uh, yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Love it. Uh, a movie you've seen multiple times, but it doesn't matter. When it comes back on, you have to watch it again. <laughs> I've got a few of those. Uh, re they're all corny. Um, Real Steel with uh, Hugh Jackman, uh, robot boxing. Uh, just a great story about a dad and his kid. Yeah. Um, uh, Fool's Gold, um, Kate Hudson, Matthew uh -huh. McConaughey. Yeah. Um, and My Cousin Vinny. Oh, yeah. just mm -hmm. classic. Two of the it best performances of all time between those really? two. And mm -hmm. then finally, uh, your first celebrity crush. Oh, Alyssa Milano from Who's okay. the Boss. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. can't argue with that there. <laughs> there you go. You're off the hot seat. Uh, Dennis O'Neill, thank you so much. A really, really great stuff. Always good catching up. And uh, thanks course. for all you do to bring clarity and wisdom and meaning to what it is that we do in the sales and marketing profession. Thanks very much, Jeff. So there you go, Murph. A fantastic conversation with uh, Dennis O'Neill. He he's such an interesting guy because he's he's got the combination of intelligence and wisdom, right? He he's got the data, but he also knows how to uh, um, uh, apply the data. Great conversation. Well, and I think you just uh, mentioned it. Uh, both you and he talked about the fact that uh, it, it, the internet provides us with information, but it's the salespeople who provide us with wisdom. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just love that. It's such a higher level uh, when you're talking about getting to the meaning of what they are there for in the first place. I absolutely loved his quote, when you remove the emotional component, that logical thread can be broken by any minor variable. And that is so critical, even before we get into the discussion on the internet, which tends to be not emotional, by the way, but in the relationship between a sales professional and a customer, if it's all relying on logic, as Dennis said, it's such a weak thread. 
when you remove the emotional component, that logical thread can be broken by any minor variable. That's my new favorite quote, by the way. Uh, as I look at it from that perspective, I'm reminded of Daniel Kahneman, who said, when we take out the emotional component of a decision, we make lesser decisions, we make worse decisions. And I think that that's really, really a valuable mindset for all of us to be looking at it and saying, there's a lot of data already. There's a lot of logic already. There's a lot of analysis already. So what's missing that we can't get out of the internet? And what's missing is that emotion, that emotion that leads to really understanding people, to really knowing who they are. It makes all the difference in the world. And if we just going to look at it and say, you know, the internet is the biggest feature dumper ever, and it is, then why would they need me to do even more feature dumping. We absolutely don't want to do this. And so when we look at the big difference, well, what, what makes salespeople so valuable still and continue to be? Because they have the ability to learn. They have the ability to ask the right questions and then to give them the perspective that they didn't even know that they needed. That's what we just learned from Dennis. And I think that that's really, really critical. So there's a big moral to this story, the way that I see it as uh, it relates to this conversation with Dennis O'Neill. And that is that don't do what the internet can already do for you. Do the things that the internet cannot do for you. Engage the emotion, look for the meaning, try and figure out how to provide not facts, but wisdom. How do we get people to that highest level so that they want to do business with you and only with you? And when we do that right, that's when they have the opportunity to change their world. Hey, by the way, before we wrap it up, I've got a new book coming out. It's titled Follow Up and Close the Sale. And in it, I'm going to share with you what you need to know for successful follow-up that's going to benefit you throughout your career. If you want to join the interest list over the book, if you want to stay notified on all things related to follow-up and some value extras that we're going to throw your way, just go to jeffshore.com slash sales follow-up and share your email with us.